Hello, welcome to those who are just joining us. It looks like we have a few more people in the waiting room here and a few of you are still connecting to audio. Welcome everyone to Mondays with Mooch. We're going to begin in just a moment. Thanks for your patience while you were hanging out in the waiting room. Welcome, folks. Welcome to Mondays with Mooch. I am Joe Muccioli. Some people know me as Mooch, i.e. Mondays with Mooch. And these events are produced and presented by the nonprofit organization Jazz Arts Project. And our platinum presenting partner is Ocean First Bank, with support from Mammoth Arts and from you, our supporting members. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Jazz music has always been an evolving art form. From its earliest origins, thought to be late 19th century, early 20th century, and with its roots in ragtime, blues, and black church music, jazz evolved and was passed on from one musician to another, and from one generation to another. It was a music steeped in Western classical music theory, but melded with the rhythms and flavor of the Caribbean and of Africa, and of other cultures in what is known now as the melting pot of history, America. The music was largely learned and innovated on the bandstand. By following the more experienced players, young musicians learned all about the music, how to play, what notes to use and when, how to phrase a melody, how to play with a good feel, a good time, the way to lead a band, how to count off a tune, or to program a set the right time to modulate, how to work a crowd, and how to hold yourself in front of an audience. There is a lineage from early practitioners such as Buddy Bolden, Joe King Oliver, Louis Armstrong, Jelly Roll Morton, all the way through to today's young players. Each generation has the benefit of experience and knowledge available to them via their predecessors, not only by recorded examples, but by personal experience playing next to their mentors and being coached by the masters of the day. The lineage of saxophonists is rich in history and profound musical innovation. In 1942, when Adolf Sax took a clarinet mouthpiece and threw it on some kind of brass instrument so it could play louder in military bands, he knew he was on to something. And yes, that, that was his name, Sax, Adolf Sax. Since then, a long line of expert saxophonists paved the way towards perfection, innovation, and musical exploration. After extensive use in military bands dating from around 1850, it wasn't until Sidney Bechet, a contemporary of Louis Armstrong, when a virtuosic approach and bluesy style boosted the involvement of the sax in early jazz styles. From there, beginning in the 1920s, the lineage included the likes of Coleman Hawkins, Johnny Hodges, Ben Webster, Lester Young, Charlie Parker, Sonny Rollins, Col John Coltrane, 
Ornette Coleman, Michael Brecker, Kenny Garrett, etc., 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 up through today's Masters of the Instrument. Each of these stood on the shoulders of their musical forebearers. So fast forward to today's guest. Several weeks ago, we had saxophonist Bruce Williams and then Rodham Schwartz as our special guests. Bruce and Rodham are prime examples of their generation being mentored by predecessors and of carrying the art form forward and passing it on. Anthony Nelson Jr. is our guest today, and he was a student of Rodham Schwartz from early on and has been mentored over the years by Bruce as well as by many others. Anthony has been carving out his own voice ever since. He is now holding his own as a new generation of sax and jazz mastery, perfecting, innovating, and passing it on to his own students. I'm proud to say that I have had him in several of my own bands and orchestra settings and that he has been one of our instructors and mentors in the cl and clinicians in our Jazz Arts Academy program. Anthony Nelson Jr. ignites fans with his melodic originality, using together jazz's classic tranquility, gospel spirituality, funk's rougher edges, and neo soul's undeniable velvet ease to produce a sound unlike anything on today's shelves. A saxophonist, flautist, clarinetist, and bass clarinetist, Anthony is blessed with an inherent talent that is boundless in its ability to reach across generational and genre lines. Anthony has three CDs out under his own name and has performed and toured extensively with such artists as MacArthur Award winner and Grammy-nominated violinist Regina Carter, the OJs, Duke Ellington Orchestra, Ray Charles Orchestra, Ralph Peterson, the Count Basie Orchestra, the Cab Calloway Orchestra, Cecil Brooks III, T.S. Monk, Steve Ture, to name just a few. He has appeared several times on some of our own events, such as Summer Jazz Cafe and in the Red Bank Jazz Orchestra on stage at the Count Basie Theater. Folks, please welcome Anthony Nelson, Jr. Welcome. How are you doing? Hey. Good, Anthony. We're glad you're here. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. That was quite an introduction from Joe. <laughs> I didn't hear the thunderous really... applause. Boy, guys, <laughs> if you're going <laughs> to... Let's un unmute ourselves when you want to applaud. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, one of the reminders I have here in the chat, please, if you, whenever there is an applause opportunity, please remember to unmute yourself first so you're not clapping there in silence. We uh, definitely want as much of a thunderous applause <laughs> as we can get here in our virtual uh, our virtual room. Oh, here. wait a second. There you go. That intro was so awesome. I could actually go for it again. We could try the applause all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give Anthony a round of applause just for showing up here. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Later on, I'll bring in some canned applause so, you know. <laughs> We can we can have an a, an audience track going along with us. I have a laugh now track ready NFL. too. I have a <laughs> laugh track ready to you. Anthony, it's good to see you, man. It's good to see you too, Mooch. It's been too long uh we Indeed. just haven't had a chance to see each other because of everything In going on. Indeed. Indeed. I obviously you're still playing. I heard you had a little little giglet not too long ago. What? Couple, within days, right? Actually, it was just this past Saturday. Um, I'm on a, in addition to being running um, Arts in the Sanctuary here in Plainfield, um, I'm also part of the Plainfield Arts Council. Um, and we had an encore performance of uh, my trio. And so it was really fun because uh, the focus was on art and jazz. Well, visual arts and jazz. Uh, Plainfield actually has the oldest art school in all of new jersey the ducre center um 
and it's a wonderful wonderful art school and uh we had this beautiful beautiful porch series and so what we did was we had everyone pre present producing art while we were improvising music improvising jazz we did some some we got into some songs i don't know how we got how we started and i'm really not quite sure how we ended i listened back it sounded pretty good but we were composing with the audience all all at the same time. That's great, great artwork came out of that. Jazz on the porch. Jazz on the porch. There's there's a title for your next CD. Jazz from the porch. <laughs> Who knows? So Anthony uh, has been in a lot of our my productions, certainly in various bands. Um, he's a go-to guy for me on Barry Sachs. But he's also um, a, a master of all the woodwinds. Well, at least all the single reed woodwinds, right? Yes, I, I for some reason caught on a long yeah, time are. ago that that's about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven instruments back there. there uh, I I realized after a while if uh, I play enough instruments that I didn't really want to be bothered with double reeds. Though I do own some, I just don't take them out the house. When he says double reeds, he's talking about oboes and bassoons, which has a, actually a weird double reed and is a really difficult instrument to play. I leave those to Patience Higgins. I there leave you go. those to Patience. That's one go. of my mentors. Mm hmm. Listen, why don't we he listen to that that cool blues thing? That was in the uh, intro. Let me listen to some more of that. It's uh, called um, No Words for the Blues. No Words for the Blues. You have that, Melissa? Yes. Oscar? Oh yeah, that's Oscar Perez. There you go. And uh, Matt Parrish on bass. Uh huh. And everybody knows Peter Brooks the third producer and club owner.
Hmm. Yeah. I haven't heard this in a long time. <laughs> it's Play still it good. Oscar. All right, Melissa, this is a good spot. You know what's funny is that that's um, an outtake. Is that, that right? We didn't use that's um, from my second CD, Tenor for Two. Yep. We uh, yeah we we didn't use that track. I was like, man, why didn't we use that recording? <laughs> it's <a> great, great <laughs> track. I mean, we used the song. We just used a different take. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. I see. Cool. You know that that was that uh. The swings. I mean that. You know, I was, I'm going to say this openly now because it's been out, that CD's been out for about uh, 10 years. Well, just for about nine years. I was nervous about doing that album because it was, it's the way that I, it's one of the ways that I love to present this music that I love, that we love. But for lack of a better term, not a lot of saxophonists in my generation we're playing in that style and I was nervous you know I said well you know I gotta play like this I have to play like that you know they're not gonna play this and I was wrong <laughs> <laughs> that's how we learn you good well you know the, the thing is that was calling on calling on my those heroes of mine like Houston persons and um a matter of fact the basis on that recording is the guy working with Houston Persons right now? Yeah, uh, Matt Parrish. Well, that's kind of like what I was talking about in the in the intro, is that you know we pass it down, the from one generation to another, and you're you know you if you're um, essentially paying homage to Houston Person, that's you know that's fantastic. That's what it's about. You know he's he's let's let's be clear here. A lot of guys forget to mention Houston. Um, and that's I think that's a shame because he comes from a long lineage of saxophone that is often underappreciated. Matter of fact, I'll go on record as saying, and you know, his lineage helped make more jazz fans than some of the others. That Gene Ammons, the Stanley Tarantines, you know, those those guys, the sit those sit uh, Selden Pals of the world. You know those those guys, and of course, ooh, Eddie Lockjaw Davis. Those guys that knew how to growl and could just, you know, sounded like they're playing an up tempo song, but look like they're escorting you to uh, the promised land. Right. <laughs> you know, I had right. to fix my words. Mm -hmm. Perfect for a date night. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I remember when you did that album, and I, I, in fact, you showed me a, a, a mock-up, I think, of the cover, and I loved it. It was great. Uh, I wish I had the graphic to show show the cover. It's very cool. You actually showed it. You showed it I, earlier. I did. I showed it in the in the. Um, uh, let's see if I can find <laughs> it somewhere. I'll come up with it. it anyway. was... Tenor Tenor for two. It was a very cool album cover. And you know, there's actually you said there was three albums. There's actually there was actually a, a fourth album that I snuck in between Tenor for Two and Swift to Hear Slow to Speak that I didn't work. It never went to radio. I just put it out. It was Live at Twins Jazz. I'll, I'll get that in one second. That's not my phone, but you know, <laughs> um, you <laughs> if know, it's for me, I'm not here. Right, right, right. But there was a yeah. There was that was. That was a special album with some great musicians that I miss very much because I don't see them nearly often enough anymore. You know? What you gonna do? Yeah. Um, you know, I just noticed that uh, in, in a homage to uh, the fact that you ha have come around to our academy class as a clinician and a, an instructor i noticed that there's there are several of our students um here some of them have their cameras on some of them don't some of them are are, are being shy but um 
Alex. I see Alex right here, even though his name says Ellie. <laughs> um, were you were you around with when uh, Anthony was was uh, teaching? I don't think so. Um, I, maybe, maybe once or twice. Yeah, it's hard to yeah. remember. It's a long time ago. I'm ancient. <laughs> I know. I know that Frank Dabari is here. You, you ah, remember Frank. Frank, right, Anthony? Of course, I know say, Frank. Say hey, Frank. Hey, how you doing? I, Frank, I love Frank because Frank had. I was hard on Frank. I can yeah, say that now. I was. Hard, I was hard on Frank. I was hard. I said, Frank, which I said, Frank, what are you doing? Let's think about this. But the rule of thumb that I that I got from um, a lot of my mentors was to never uh, chastise someone if, unless you're going to tell them what they need to know. You know, so I was very fortunate when I used to, when I first came on the scene, I was hanging out at the Peppermint Lounge. So I was 16 years old, being very fortunate to catch what was probably the tail end of a local jazz scene. I mean, meaning like local clubs. And so we had the Peppermint Lounge. That was Newark, where, right? Oh, yeah. East, actually, it was Orange, right on Main Street. But, you know, right. Orange, East Orange, Newark, it's right. basically the same thing when you look at the history of the music. And so I remember plenty of nights I would be there. And um, I remember one night uh, Jimmy McGriff walks in. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Don, Don Williams, the, you know, wonderful organ, organ drummer, just great drummer, great master drummer as a whole, was his drummer. So, and that was one that had an organ there. So it was an organ house. So if he was in town, he would come down. Uh, you might look up, see Jerry Weldon, oh, dear God, Bill Saxton. I mean, these are, these are tenor saxophone heroes. That's where I first met Bruce, was at the Peppermint Lounge. Not to mention one of my mentors, another one of my mentors, uh, James Stewart, who plays just as many instruments as I do. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, and then you know, Gene Gee, Lance Bryant. So there was always a plethora of great musicians still hanging out in the clubs in New Jersey. And that was... You know, that was one of the houses. It was owned by um, the Johnson family. Uh, Mr. Johnson was one of the first black millionaires in this country, in um, New Jersey. And so, you know, it was it was a wonderful place because I remember uh, I remember getting checked there several several nights. You know, <laughs> those guys would tell you, for lack of a better term. You can't play. This is why you can't play. And this is how you're going to fix it. The, and, you know, sometimes we don't tell those things anymore. And if you do tell it, then you're vibing someone. You're too hard. You know, <laughs> this music was not brought up by weak people. People struggled to make this music happen. That's right, and they and, and, and they, still they do. took it very personally. Right, you know, they, you know, it was. We didn't necessarily have uh, the Jazz Arts Project or any of the other um, institutions that are around right now, and it definitely wasn't in colleges. You know, you know, so we're we're very fortunate, and in in terms of studying this music privately. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. When I I, I was at uh, Manhattan School of Music at a time when there was a big band, but that was it. There was a big band, and I think there was one jazz improvisation course given by um, a blind piano player. I can't remember her name. Um, more, um I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, that's it. The, everything else was classical in the school. You know, go to today where there's a whole in that same Manhattan School of Music in the same building. Now there's a whole jazz department, and they're you know, they're churning out a hundred jazz players a, a year or more. The the only now see now there's so at the risk of sounding like a 
as if I'm never happy, which I am very, I'm happy all the time about this music. <laughs> the one thing, <laughs> the one thing I would point out is that prior to the college explosion, to everyone going to college to learn about this music, the music was more about the people. Um, I remember being at the Peppermint Lounge one night, you know, you hung out at the Peppermint Lounge, you found your way for some reason to Harlem, because this is this beautiful connection between Newark and Harlem that has always existed. Um, I remember hanging out at uh, Peppermint Lounge and one night, uh, Buddy Miles walks in and they all knew him, you know, so he sits in and I mean, this groove gets to going so hard and I remember looking at, um, I don't remember if it was Rodham or Bruce. I said, oh my God, how do you play over that? <laughs> I mean, it was, it was like one of those, I mean, it, it never let it, one of those, like, it was like one of those driving home, uh, Lockjaw and Johnny Griffin, but with Oregon blueses. And I mean, if you guys don't know those references, go listen to, um, just go listen to Lockjaw and Eddie Griff and Johnny Griffin's Breakfast at Mittens. You hear that album, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about when I say groove that would not let up. And I mean, the intensity never let up. It, it was just driving. And I mean, people are screaming in a club, you know, and it was a Tuesday night. <laughs> right. And people came out it was a it. It was a Tuesday night, buy a drink, and you could stay there almost as long as you wanted, as long as you bought another drink, and they were buying ribs on the other side. It was, it was, and I remember thinking, you had to, if you weren't cutting it, people turned their ears off to you. It wasn't a thing of, you go to college, you learn how to play the music, and you're upset with the audience when they don't listen to you because you learned in college, you're so killing it, it was either you connected to the audience or you didn't eat. You went, you brought the audience to you, not you didn't demand the audience come to you. Right. This leads into a question we had, but before we get to the question, um, uh, Lynn Mueller, yes, it was Valerie Capers, indeed, who, who uh, I, I took a jazz improvisation course with. Valerie Capers, she was wonderful. Anyway, the question was, um, let's see, who were your influences growing up? I mean, you already started talking about some of them. Well, you know, there was, I know some people would expect me to say every great tenor player or saxophonist that ever lived that I never met and that was going way before my time. But I was one of those guys that was very fortunate to actually catch the the people that I consider to be the most vital guys in this music, those Bill Saxtons. I mean, <laughs> I'll tell I'll, I'll tell a Bill Saxton story later, but I got to be around Bill Saxton, Gene Gee, who he Gene Gee's a great tenor saxophonist. That um, I, I don't even know how to describe it. He was. He 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 was good friends with Mobley and uh he hung out with Train, you know. So he was he's one of those guys. And not to mention Leo Johnson, who I remember one of the most important lessons that he told me was he looked me dead in the eye and he said when I went to go sit in with him, he says He said, Yeah, yeah, Nelson, you sounding good. You sound real good. He said, But eventually you gonna learn that what you're saying with twenty notes you can say with two. <laughs> <laughs> and I was mm -hmm. it out of his head. And that was, I didn't get it at the moment. I said, man, how can you possibly say everything I'm saying with two? With oh, okay. Okay. I, I hear you, Leo. It took, it's, uh, then I had to grow up some and then I learned. And, you know, there was, there was so many individuals. I mean, you know, I got to mention Marshall McDonald who, Used to pull my coattail on the bandstand with um, the Duke Ellington Orchestra. Mark Gross had this level of professionalism and excellence that I had to take note of. 
And of course, Bruce, Bruce Williams and, and Cecil Brooks III, I'm going to tell you now, I would have no albums out if it wasn't for Cecil. Because he pushed me and he made me look at things in a way. You know, you know what? As much as he taught me about music, he taught me about something that they don't teach anymore in the music. Yes, I know I sound a bit like a curmudgeon, but I remember why I was told I couldn't play. And a lot of guys get away with murder now. <laughs> he taught me about something they don't know to teach anymore. Etiquette. There is a bandstand etiquette. And there's a professional etiquette, you know. Some young guys, while you're on the, while they're on a gig with you, they're passing out their cards, and they say, "Where are you going to be?" And they say, "They say, well, where are you guys going to be next?" Well, I'm going to be, and they tell they run out every place they're going to be playing or right. working. Well, he had to teach me that etiquette because no one had ever told me. He said, "Hey, you, you'll find yourself never getting called again by these older guys," and he literally saved me from making some drastic mistakes now you know people just i guess the younger guys don't care about that much it's uh you know it, but they'll there was an etiquette they'll get it sooner or later right hopefully i'm, I'm counting on it you know you know you know them. you know ben from our program also right ben fig and he's How he's soaking doing, it ben? up i can see it he's soaking it up what you're saying what's going on anthony how you doing, Ben? It's good to see you, little brother. Likewise. I'm paying attention. I'm paying. Woo! Look at that boy. The boy growing all up, losing all, the, <laughs> lost all the baby fat. Look at, <laughs> looking like he's about ready to run a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, he's probably taller than me too now, aren't you? Oh. Well, I can't oh, outcycle you. I know that. So. Oh. Well, yeah. okay. Thank God. Th you can't outcycle me. <laughs> well, well, he can. Well, he said he can. No, I, I, cannot, I don't think I he can. Oh really? Right. Absolutely not. Yeah, you should see my sons. My son spends are... more time. He spends more time sitting on a drum throne, no doubt, than than a bicycle. Hey, you need some. I, I need I, that cy cycling saved my life. Cycling saved my life. Mister Nelson, I didn't know you've been. Uh, I didn't know you played with with Ralph Peterson. I've been studying with him for a few months now. Oh my goodness. Um he he I only I didn't play with him a lot. It was like once one or two times, but we did something that I'll tell you this and I can admit it now. We did something at William Patterson. It was a trio and it ended up being trio. Uh Calvin Hill and um and Ralph Peterson and myself. Jesus, I was, yeah, it, it went well, but I remember thinking that's a lot of power behind me. That that's a lot of power. That was, that was a lot of power. I, I, I was happy. I started cycling because that was a lot of power behind me, pushing me forward. And yeah, that's, yeah, it was a lot of power behind me. <laughs> hey, here's a, here's a, here's an interesting question. Um, that I found. Will you play some bass clarinet for us? I know it's there. <laughs> it, it just, for some reason, I took it back. I, I used it over the weekend. <laughs> into some ornate hole in there. Oh yeah, that was <laughs> Yeah, I didn't have it adjusted. That's a great sound though. This is a, 
I love bass clarinet. As much as I love Dolphy, and I really do love Dolphy because he's the reason why I started playing flute. My favorite Eric, part Eric of the Dolphy instrument. We're talking about. Eric Dolphy. I'm sorry for anybody, everybody playing along at home. Uh, <laughs> Eric Dolphy, especially if you get some of those albums that he did with um, with Oliver Nelson of all things. Him and Oliver Nelson, and even him and uh, Makunda McIntyre did some interesting things together. They might say Ken McIntyre when you look at the records, but uh, they did some interesting things. Thunderous applause. Thank you. That was, that was my my request. Thank you. That was Glenn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Glenn. Thank you for that because I don't I don't get a chance to take it out as much as I would like to. Yeah. I, you know. I, 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 love, I love the sound of a bass clarinet. It's a great sound. Such a great sound. Yeah. I was actually had all intents and per for all intents and purposes this past weekend. I said, man, I want to play some ballads on bass clarinet. Um, and I don't know if I ever got around to it. I don't remember what I played or how long I played it. Once <laughs> I was just happy to have an instrument, instruments out the house, and uh, using them. <laughs> I had all intentions on uh, probably doing that. On the, it was on going to be on bass, clarinet, or flute. Lover man. Excellent, uh, excellent. Uh, I'm sorry, um, Cat Boy just showed. He got put on your mask if you're going to come in because I can't. Um, yes, I hope this isn't going to mess with royalties or anything. <laughs> Here you go, son. My my sons found me in my office, so. And they're they're gearing up. You know what they're gearing up for. Even though it won't be the way they normally do it. Right. Sorry, am I uh Oh there you go. Wow. Asir, say hello. Hi. Okay, now you gotta go. Oh. Mm, you just woke up, huh? Okay, good. Go downstairs. Go to see mommy. And your brothers and Aliana. I just that? that's my youngest son. That's a seer. You know, there's six. So my mic working okay, Melissa? Yeah, you're. Okay. Yeah, it can be a little bit louder, but we can still hear you. Uh, yeah. It just fell apart on me and all over the place. So I'm. That's why I'm wondering. Oh, uh, yeah, we can still hear you. You just sounds a little bit lower, but how's this? Any 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 better now? Yes. Okay, cool. Sorry, folks. So, uh, yeah, there's I mean, there's other students all over here that probably remember you. Max Kaiser, did you know Max? Yes. Max, is, uh, Max he's an old man now. He's like probably out of college by now. What? How you been, hey, Max? Doing good. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. What, man? What school did you end up going to? Um, Mary Wood University. Mm. Yeah, it's in Scranton, well, Pennsylvania. I, I, man, it was um that Scranton is not too far from Pottsville. No, it's a little bit further. It's a little bit closer than Pottsville. Right. Yeah, that's where my clarinet company is. About yeah. fifty miles away. 
Right. Okay, that's close enough to me right about now. <laughs> All right. Good to see you, Max. I, I, so, what are you doing now? Um. Well, now I'm a sophomore in college studying music therapy. Yeah. There you go. That's killing. Oh, I thought you were out of college already. Nah. <laughs> He's on his way to paying taxes. There you go. Mm -hmm. Somebody is. Somebody asked, I, I, did I answer this? I don't remember. What was the, the name of that tune? Um, the Blues? It was No Words for the Blues on his Tenor for Two album. I think, uh, John, did you ask that? You're muted. You're muted, of course. <laughs> He's talking away there. He's muted away. <laughs> Got to unmute yourself. Yeah, it looks like John... John Gentile. John Gentile, you're muted. Yep. Yeah. There you go. Okay. None of it was worth hearing, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I asked the question because I wasn't listening. You know, he, the tune was introduced, and as soon as it was typed out, I, I remembered that it was introduced. And it was a beautiful performance. I enjoyed it very much. And Thank uh, you. great conversation tonight. And, uh, I don't want to talk because I'm learning so much listening. Anthony, did you write that tune? Yes. That's yes. his own composition. It's great. That should there should be that should be out more. My wife I, I'm gonna be my wife oh, had the name of the tune. She thought it was a standard. Right. Well should that's be. I wrote about four five songs for that album because and I wanted the and the ones that I did on that album that I use on that album that I compose were all uh, kind of down the pipe. Kind of sounds like they could have been standards. You know, they were in that vein, you know. You want to play Silly? Is that, do you have that? Okay. Melissa, do you have something called Silly? Yes. Now, as you listen to this, this was supposed to be a slow dance between my grandmother and grandfather. And before... And his nickname... Go ahead. His nickname for her, her name was Sylvia, but he called her Silly. So I always imagine my smooth grandfather getting her on the dance floor. And while you're listening, check out this very cool album cover.
Song. Nice glass of Pinot Grigio with that, I think. Mm. Very nice. Um, Anthony, you do have some albums available. Where might people find them? Is All there a link that you? Is there a link you could put in the uh, chat box? I we most can, certainly can. We can go from there. Right now, uh, let me see. All of my albums are still available on iTunes. Um, um, Amazon, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, why don't you maybe list the albums, or or a, is there is there a website they can go to, or a a, a site that lists all of them? Uh, yes, actually, my website has all of them. Why don't you put uh, that link in there? Um, let me see, Anthony Nelson. And while you're doing that, I just want to express how great it is to have someone like Anthony A here talking to us, but also as part of our our uh, team, as it were, as our family of um, instructors at the Jazz Arts Academy over the many years. And hopefully we'll be back to doing in-person classes, although we're not quite there yet. We're still working out the, the um, Zoom lessons that might start up in a little while uh, this fall. But um, Anthony's a real great treasure for the kids. And I just want to point out also that the organization that presents this, these Monday evening, for people who don't know, is the Jazz Arts Project. Mm. It's a nonprofit organization based here in, in Red Bank. And we, for 15 years, have been presenting live world class jazz. and education programs for area students many of which are here today saying hello to to uh, Anthony and uh, some of which anyway I'd say many we've had hundreds and hundreds of students come through our our classes um, but we are a nonprofit and we you know we survive by by grants and donations from our uh, supporting members Jacqueline, can you put a, the link, whatever it is, to our yes. donation page or our website? And um, if anyone is so inclined, we'd love to include you as a supporting member. Yep, absolutely. It's there in the chat. Thanks. Hey, hey Mood, someone asked a question I would love to answer. Go for it. Um, who is this? Ah, Lady Jacqueline asked the question, Anthony, where do you find inspiration to write music? Yes. Tell and your secret. I, <laughs> well, you know, there's, it comes from a wide variety of places. Um, like, take that last song, for instance, Silly. When I composed that, I, um, I was listening to a lot of cl uh, classical saxophone. And so the goal became, I, I never, I didn't actually improvise on that song. The goal became how, improvising by um, telling the story of the melody, telling this, the, me the story that was implied by the melody. And so I literally pictured my grandmother and grandfather dancing and you know him holding her close and you know him being sincere because I respect I try to instill the same values that he placed in me with my son so there was nothing but respect so that song was inspired from the man that I look up to the most that ever lived 
um, for me personally, my grandfather, Charles Edward Doyle, otherwise known as Grampy. <laughs> and, and so it was all about telling the story. There's other compositions that I compose, which are based off of books that I've read or scriptures that I've read. Um, my CD, Swift to Hear, Slow to Speak, for all of my Bible scholars out there, is based off of James 119. My brethren, let us be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for wrath does not reveal the righteousness of God. And so that whole insight for that song was inspired from scriptures. And matter of fact, that whole album, like I said, was based off of scriptures that that was a uh, very impactful to me. It's really my trial sermon. You know, as a as a young minister, that was my trial sermon in many ways. Um, so, and then I'm a big fan of Percival Everett and Walter Mosley. Um, there's so many great places to to uh, get insight to compose and to tell a story. Uh, I'm currently writing right now for someone that's on this chat, even as we speak. Um, her name's Tasha Vaughn. She's writing some, some, my son's up here, but I say he heard, he heard her name. He's like, Aunt Tasha's on the, on the chat. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's writing, she writes children's books and she, she writes a, a plethora of other um, material, but she has some chi some children books that are prepared that she's preparing to release. So please keep an eye out for her. Um, we're working on the music that's going to accompany her books, you know, for other formats and for some of the live presentations that we'll do of her readings. So there's there's a all you have to do is open up your eyes sometimes and you can find inspiration for how uh, how you're going to decide to share or communicate. One song I composed is called At the Guggenheim. I haven't recorded it yet, but I composed it at the Guggenheim because it was the first trip I ever took. You know, I'm uh, adopted all six of my children. And so the first time I took my my second daughter on a trip, we went to the Guggenheim Museum with the camp that she was in. And all these kids are in there. They're sketching. They took a little art class. And I'm watching this one little girl. I mean, she's going and she's her stuff should be hanging on the wall at some point in time. And as she's doing what she's doing, I'm hearing this melody in my head. And I put out my iPad, as you know, those things come in handy. And I'm playing the piano and I recorded the song as I'm playing it on piano, came home and and finished it. And the song became at the Guggenheim and it was based off of this young lady that was composing artwork without without anyone telling her new rules it was her just creating and so that's there's a wide variety of places mostly from stories that's a very long answer i'm sorry but you know it was yeah. uh it, it it literally comes from everything i do everything that i read my my daughter was dancing today and I started humming a melody, and so she started dancing more. And because she responded to it, I wrote it down. <laughs> you know, I write for children. Incredible. You, know, you mentioned composition, those compositions you did not improvise to, but in essence, composition is an improvisation. It's an improvisation yes. of a composer, right? And jazz yes. players essentially compose uh, at the speed of light when they improvise. Right. Yes. A composer will improvise on on paper or on a computer mm. these days, but you know, um, it, it is a it is improvisation. Son, pass me that book right there. Underneath all those other books, the one that says music. Oh, okay. Never mind. Yeah. Well, you know that's the, that's the thing. There, there's the one of the art forms that's lost with in the um concept of everybody wanting to be the next great solo artist is that playing in a big band 
there's actually a great deal of improvisation. And I mean, just in the way that you interpret the melodies. I mean, you know, you could. Uh, I remember Jack Jeffers said, I could put this song in front of three different bands and it'll sound different every time. Because whoever's right. playing lead alto, I mean, Mark Gross told me a story about having, um, about working when he was in Lionel Hampton's band. And he said to Ham, you know, I want, you know, I'd love to get more solos. And Ham said, well, boy, you solo all night. <laughs> if you play lead alto, you are soloing all night because you're right. literally guiding how the band moves, how the saxophone section moves. Lead alto and trumpet are the, and especially the lead alto, you know, because we, we get to play all the pretty stuff, all color, color it up, you know, you know, we, how, how do I want to say this? We get to add all the ambiance, a la uh, Johnny Hodges and um, Marshall Royal and, and, and most people wouldn't think to say this, but Frank Strozier and uh, Sahib Shahab, those guys played amazing. Oh, and you got to put Phil Woods in there too, who's an amazing lead alto sure. player. Yep. You know, there, there's, and Bruce Williams, you know, Cleve Guy, and there's so many wonderful lead alto players, and it's an art form that people think you just had to play the loudest or be the best reader. No, being a lead alto player meant you had a personality and I'm, I'm very fortunate i was around some guys that had personality the same swag that they walked around with you saw that swag when they sat down in the saxophone section and they and they just lit everything a matter of fact for everybody that's on here if there's one album everybody should have it's it's for if you want to know how to play lead alto and being an and still being an amazing solo personality get gil evans orchestra um gil evans album uh new uh old wine new bottles no do what you know what i'm talking about mooch it's yeah i it's it's new old wine, wine new bottles. Old, that's right old wine new bottles yeah. and here's the thing listen to the second selection where because it's all the whole thing is featuring Johnny Cole and Cannonball Adderley. It's, okay, it's really featuring Cannonball Adderley. Cannonball, yeah. Cannonball is blitzing through this solo, and out of nowhere, he goes right into the section. I mean, I said, I was driving in my car and had to pull over, and I said, I need to grow up. <laughs> Dig it. I'm not a I'm not a grown man until I can do that. He was he at, at, for everything that he was playing, he was never he was not so into himself that he couldn't make sure that the whole band was together. Yep. I said I I was I felt like Dave Chappelle when I looked at myself. You need to step your game up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's exactly well, how I felt. We have, I think we have something on clarinet. Um, we have a pretty much time just for one more tune. And this Ubel clarinet, you think we should play that? Yes, please. Matter of fact, that's the first night I, I got the, it's a, this is my baby. This is my baby. I, I, I found her at NAMM and then I came back home and they, like I said, they just happened to be in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a German-made clarinet. It's a U-Bell Zenith with, made up with Mopani, Mopani wood. Yeah. Fancy. No dancing. one's allowed No one's allowed to touch this. Even my 17-month-old my my daughter looks at this and she says, No, he still likes me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep it that way. Well, let's so, say you, you have know, that, the, right? There you go. And this is with the George, this is with the George G Orchestra.
was short and sweet. I, I forgot the name of that song. It was um actually one of um Benny Goodman's features. Mm-hmm. I, I, I forgot the name of it. I, So, um, we're pretty much at the end of this, but it was uh, a pleasure, Anthony, to have you. If there are any last-minute questions, we can sneak them in. Ooh, have you ever played a bass flute? Um, no. <laughs> but I have I have hired bass flute flautists before in, I, in several continents in fact and it's a fantastic instrument you have a, an alto alto this flute this is an alto flute there you go and when you yeah, play that not. down in the low register man that's there's nothing like it Oh, and Tasha's um, someone asked what's her her site. It's com it's coming soon. We had to revamp a few things, so her her information on her projects will be out soon. Trust me, you you're gonna love all of her stuff. Terrific. Oh, uh, Tasha's here. Hello. Should we introduce her? Sure. Where is she? I, I, I see her in the chat. Oh, line, she said. She that. said. <laughs> she said no. She said no. LOL. <laughs> she must that, be in her jammies that, already. <laughs> that means she's doing about twenty other things. Trust me, she normally oh, okay. is. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Anthony, it was such a pleasure. It was good to catch up with you, and um, you know, sooner or later, you'll be back on our stages. Absolutely. And uh, I appreciate you spending the time with us. And I appreciate, I appreciate you having me. Every time, all the time. I appreciate everyone else who's, who's come by. And um, what we do now is we uh, basically turn off the cameras and shut down the, the Facebook feed. And we have what's, what we refer to as an after gig hang. Anybody who would like to hang out a little bit and chat for a little bit more, you're welcome to hang. So, um, officially, thank you so much. And come by next week. I think, you know, we're, we're doing the woodwind section. So next week's going to be another sax player. But I'm not at liberty quite yet to say it. I'll, I'll announce it tomorrow or the next day. Um, but come by next week. We're going to continue to do these as long as you guys continue to be interested. So um, thanks again, Anthony. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Thank and you, Anthony. That's great. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks so much. Very good. Thank you.